Hello. Uh, this is just an update on um, where I am with the new album, uh, which we'll just call for the moment. What should we call it? What did we call it? Uh, well, it's Fireside Songs or Campfire Songs. Um, just to give it some sense of personality and this this of course is the uh, um, a more acoustic set of uh, songs and, and pieces of music uh, based around um, my acoustic guitar which was tuned to D on one of my acoustic guitars uh, and the resonator which is also tuned to, to a standard uh, a, a D tuning um, <clears throat> and um, so yes it's a collection of music and um, I just wanted to update as to the state of play so um, I've actually got and recorded bits of all of the songs now uh, in, in a they're all existing in a rough form. I have demo versions of them um, and uh, no vocals. Uh, in fact I've got 13 tracks now. I, I want to keep it to 10 so a few of those tracks are going to be knocked on the head between two or three um, are going to disappear completely. Um, I might pull one into working with another track so that it gives me a little bit more uh, a variety on on a couple of tracks which I feel are a little bit samey. Now I've, I've actually had a little bit of uh, feedback in the past about how I work and and why I do uh, certain things and uh, been accused, and that's not a problem, been accused of um, making mistakes, leaving mistakes in and putting details in that uh, shouldn't be there. Um, now, how best to explain that? Well, it either shows that I'm either being I, I'm being lazy and that I'm missing things or I'm rushing things or I just don't have a particularly good eye for for detail, or uh, yeah, I, I can't be bothered. Laziness, or something else. And um, on the whole, I think it's something else. I think I, that's that's how I'd like to explain it. And what it is, it's something that came that really came about in my years of taking photographs and wanting to become. Um, more proficient at taking photographs. I think I've always had a naturally good eye at framing things. Um, and so like most of us when you take photographs you want to do the best you can and you cannot take a good photograph by merely setting a camera to auto and letting the electronics do it. They'll do a fantastic job in most cases, or in, in a lot of cases, but you actually have to dig in and uh, uh, manipulate the camera and the lens and its settings to get to get s s the, the thing that you want. And that's different from merely seeing a lovely picture, a lo or rather a, a lovely scene, taking a snapshot on auto and then replicating that scene to the best of your knowledge. Uh, that's not really seeing. That's merely replicating a, a lovely scene and, go, and that would do. For many people that would do. But for the the person who's really interested in, in, in digging into that and, and maybe even seeing, seeing that vista, that image in front of them differently, you have to have already a process that says I want to blur that background or, or I want to blur that rock because it's too dominant but I, I want the I want the middle view to be seen. Oh so it's about being able to manipulate 
how the, the eye sees something in real time to manipulate how the viewer sees the flat image that you've taken. You want to draw them to a particular area within, a, within an image. So, uh, and in that instance, you, you then need to be able to control um, the technology. So I played around with this for years. I read books on it. I actually um, uh, mucked around with, with the manual processes on the camera. And I, and I, I think I've got pretty, I can take a pretty good picture. But people are so good, and the technology is so good now, that you see these amazing photographs taken by amateurs. Um, and what happens in the end is that we have, along with social media, Facebook, and, and everyone wanting to imprint their lives, uh, on social media environments and uh, uh, the the advent of much improved cameras on mobile phones, which I can remember having discussions with people in the early years, saying, "Why on earth would you want a mobile phone? A mobile phone with a with a rubbishy camera on it?" Um, and of course, you didn't need them then, but these technologies find their use once they're there you find a use for them. That's what capitalism is, by the way. It's the creative process of, of, uh, of um, selling something. It's the invention. Capitalism, pure capitalism, is invention and creativity. But anyway, um, so I was wrong about the idea of having um, the, or should I say short-sighted, but having a, a, a camera in, built inside a mobile phone, because I didn't know where it would go and of course where it's gone is that we use the lens for video, uh, live streaming um, uh, as, as a camera in its own right and the software is so good now um, to such a degree that I now take um, most of my photographs on my Android phone rather than on my proper cameras because it's so easy and I've always got it with me and I can get good results. So let's spin back to my the, the point. The point of this, uh, people are saying, hmm, there are mistakes in the things that you do. And I, my answer would be, yes, there are. And I do it on purpose. Um, I started to mess around and I, I, I've had many years experience with Photoshop from the very first first versions to, to the sort of later CS versions. Um, and I realised that what we do is we we manipulate images and we, we waste hours on finding the right filter without having the idea. We use Photoshop nowadays and we have done for many years as designers and interested people. Um, in the sort of visual art of imagery and photography. Um, we use it like a sandbox and that wastes a lot of time. That costs money. But that is how it's become used, that we try a filter. So you have an image of something, you may have cut something out, you go, yeah, that's not quite right. I want it to have a, I want it to be different in some way. And rather than say, I want it to look like an 8-bit eight, eight, eight piece of graphic or I, I want it to look like it's a screen printed item. You, you know exactly how to do that, how to process the image to do that. You can do that quickly. You can do it either manually or with, uh, with, with a filter that's already built in. It takes seconds. Um, but if you don't know what you want but you want to be inspired, you end up just running through the filters and seeing what they look like and this is where the time wasting occurs. And of course, that's now what we've now got within our mobile phones. We have filters, and have you not noticed that what all the filters tend to do? A lot of them, they tend to make the photographs look like they're aged, or like they're an old Polaroid that's three years old and been left in the sun, or probably Polaroid six months. Two days. 
and it will, it will do that. Um, and so what we end up with are these things that put artifacts that, that have some history, a false history. Um, or I've got uh, these wonderful uh, filters that bleed, look like they've, they've bled light, like the film, back of an old film camera, and the, the lid's open, been opened up and it's been exposed to a band of light, you quickly shut the lid. And we've all done that, those of us who have actually used to use proper film in cameras. Uh, all the edges become exposed and then on the negative it becomes a blob or a colour um, or a bleached out section or, or, or all these sort of these sort of artifacts uh, and I'll I'll put them in here you'll, you'll see what I mean this is exactly why we buy faded stained jeans ripped jeans ripped clothes the idea is that we want to give something that's pristine a sense that it has been lived in, that it has a history and it has a life. And the reason why I believe that is the case with many things, <clears throat> new things that look old, filters that make brand new digital photographs look like they're analogue, look like they've come from film look like they are old photographs, not new ones. Or maybe the photographs that look like they have been printed and scanned back in and reused. All these are filters, digital filters, that, that you can employ <coughs> within your art for whatever value the art has. And, that, and that's what I think they do. They are trying to illustrate some gravity to the image. They're trying to show that it has a history, it had a life. Um, whereas it hasn't. <clears throat> and I thought, that's what I like. That's what I like about not bothering about trying to get a perfect shot. Um, I have um, printed photographs that have my finger in the corner. Because what that is, is that's me looking at my family or looking at the scene or friends and taking photographs and, and just indulging in trying to get them in the shot and not noticing my fingers in the shot. That's that one moment that humanises the process between the person taking the photograph and those that are being photographed. And I just felt that that was really human and important to leave in. So I'm not bothered chasing perfect photographs anymore. I want family photographs. I want a family photograph album that has mistakes in it. Um, I won't necessarily make the put mistakes in by using filters, but I would use them on occasion to, to age them and to change the colours and make them look old. I, I, I love that. And I think a lot of people do like that. There is, the, there is the camp that likes the pristine, perfect image. And I think most people like something that's not quite perfect, even though they might not be able to explain it. And that's certainly my case. That's certainly where I stand. Now that I have taken, and I've always done this with, with my music, and I like to employ it in my music as well. Um, I like having real sounds. Um, and I, I, I sometimes prefer people to imagine they can see someone sitting and playing the guitar by the squeaks on the guitar or by maybe a rattle of, a, of a, a stud or a button on the guitar. Sometimes that's annoying and it's, it happens and it put, it's put in the wrong place and I will absolutely redo that or take it out. I'll redo the, the take of the guitar if, if it's in the wrong place or it just sounds wrong. But I always think that those sounds that aren't music, when they're heard, make the listener think about the human, the person who's making the music, whether they're a musician or not. And I think it helps evoke the sense that there is someone there. It's very easy to, to get lost in the music, for the human side to get lost. And I'm very keen to put the human element element back in 
uh, as part of the listening process. And I, I don't necessarily just use real life sounds, um, nature sounds, for, for that for that reason. That's part of storytelling. But if it also helps for it to become, to allow the the listener to place the music or the sounds in a in a real world um, experience for them that that's what I'm after so I I'm, I really do like and appreciate the mistakes and the things that are non-musical in, in, in music um, Otherwise, what you're doing is you're you're wrapping up a piece of music, and again, uh, I think you can mainstream uh, uh, or mainstream media music nowadays is um, beautifully packaged with uh, pristine photographs of um, attractive people. Um, who are evoking an emotion, a sexuality, uh, or a, a presence by the photograph or the video, but rarely in the music. I think it's that's invoked by the, uh, a vocal, <clears throat> and everyone wails and warbles, and the voice still is the presence of the human. It's still the, 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 the thing that communicates to, to the listener. The music underneath, however, more and more is becoming like a, um, a pub carpet. It's a pattern in the background that you don't really... either gets in the way of your senses um, because it's too brash or you can ignore completely. Um, it's just just there, and it's not particularly interesting. And you can kind of like a the old pub carpets <coughs> and the old hotel carpets that have never been replaced since the 1970s or 1960s. <coughs> they they are you can distinguish them, but they are you merely walk on them and don't bother focusing on them. Um, it's everything else that you're going to focus on. <clears throat> so you don't appreciate them, not particularly good, but you don't need to look at them. And I think a lot of um, a lot of music is like that, and, uh, whereas the, it's very difficult to ignore the, the vocal, that is the human element that we pick up on. Um, <clears throat> not all music, just a lot of it that, that, you're, that you would be hearing um, really constitutes that that whole sense of um, a, a, a package that has no soul. Um, so for me, <clears throat> I would happily put mistakes back in. Um, and I've said this for years now. And in the same sense that I do not want to be expert in anything I have been pulled along the line of being professional in many, many areas to, to quite a high level. And <clears throat> when I talk to my peers about things, um, there is a sense of um, looking at the, the, the ever fine sort of granularity of a problem. As you become more and more expert, you, you go further and further forward into this the sort of the granularity of what it is that you that, that you're trying to achieve as an expert and how you you can look at things the smallest detail um, that you might find interesting or is relevant to your profession and what you tend to do is move further and further away from the masses and from from a, in a sense a shared real life so while we need ex absolute experts, depending on what you are an expert in, sometimes it can be a little bit, uh, um, well, it, it can actually take you further away from seeing a, a, the real world view. You become almost myopic in your expertise. Uh, so I think I, I'd like to not be 
too expert in anything. I, I want to be able to kind of treadle between the chaos and the order of making music or creating art or uh, anything that I do. I, I want to be able to balance myself. If, if I'm too far one way, then I, I, I feel that I am pitched too far one way. So <clears throat> I want to be in um, uh, the cross between a, a hungry amateur that just loves what they do and a professional who knows how to achieve what they want in a, in a, in a direct and professional manager without necessarily manager of my craft <clears throat> without wasting too much time. So I like the chaos and I like the order and ultimately I am ordered because I am managing the chaotic. Um, that's called balance and that's I, I couldn't ask for, for more than that. So that's how I treat my music, that's certainly how I would treat any anything that I do as creative. Photographs, yes, I like the flaws in photographs. I don't want a perfect photograph. I want to take a photograph of my family or of, or of, a, of, of a, a scene or of something that is not perfect. Um, I want me to be in it by virtue of me being the, the photographer that forgot to do something or didn't quite line something up. Um, uh, and it's the same with I've, I've created a few videos that were not, there were very low budget videos for some of my music, uh, some of my songs, and um, they are, I've pulled together free elements and some of the elements that I've filmed myself, and I've purposely put in mistakes. Uh, I don't mean spelling mistakes, or I don't mean something that, that's annoying, <coughs> but um, so uh, w one video. I'm actually miming my own words and I've purposefully mimed one word in the wrong place. Um, I've done that on purpose but it looks like a mistake. I just like that element of someone going, if they notice it going, Ugh, and it suddenly, suddenly they realise, oh, he's, he's miming it. But then, afterwards, I think that I, I sync up well enough for them to completely believe that I'm singing that song that they're hearing. I'm singing the words. So I love the manipulation of pulling someone into the story but then also taking them out and saying, look at the process. This is a process you're listening. You're, you're looking at and listening to. I really like being able to manipulate the, the listener or the onlooker that way. So it is um, it's very much, look, this is me doing this. And then it's very much, oh, this is a performance. And then it's, oh, this was after the scene. That I, this, is, this is the process. Um, and I like people to be aware of the processes um, rather than just make it a fantasy world. So there you go. Long answer to a short question. How typical is that? But of course, if I could do it any other way, I wouldn't be calling this babble. <laughs>